Welcome to the One Advantage Podcast, exploring the intersections of peer power, culture, and agility. Your hosts, Mike Richardson, Jason Richmond, and Leo Butari, co-founders of the One Advantage Community and Practice and Advantage Peer Groups. For more information, please visit us at the One Advantage Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the One Advantage Podcast. We have a full house today. Uh, with Jason here and Leo here and myself, of course, and uh, this is going to be a good one, guys. I like this one. Workplace culture change takes a turtle, not a rabbit. I guess we're trying to say it's more of a marathon than a sprint. You know, everybody, uh, you're in the new year now. Uh, it's been a blur already. Uh, we're already approaching the end of January, but you've resolved to evolve your organization's culture to a healthier one this year, but you don't know how to begin. And we're here to talk about the fact that creating the culture you and your employees need to be successful takes time. And we've got two no better people than Jason and, and Leo and, and a little bit of me uh, to, to explore that together. So, of course, but first and foremost, as ever, I want to know where everybody's been and what you've been up to. Uh, Leo, let's start with you. Uh, how was the travel tail end of last year? Has been the travel so far this year? Um, travel tail end of last year, um, great. Um, and uh, and it's been smooth so far this year. I've um, <laughs> been very fortunate. and But I've spent the last week home, but I'll be hitting the road next week. Um, I'll be in Seattle uh, for three days next week. Then I'll be uh, in Seattle again for a little bit the following week. And then okay. beyond that... My first trip to uh, Quebec City um, ah. coming up later in the month and, ah. and Toronto and a whole bunch of places. February is going to be a busy month. Um, it's going to be cold um, as well. It's going to be cold up there in Quebec love City. It. I've, love been the there, cold. I've been in there in the middle of winter. A beautiful place, of course. Very historic, beautiful yeah. place. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, icebergs floating down the river there. It's uh, <laughs> something to behold. And uh, uh, spreading the good word about peer innovation, no doubt, Leo. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be another exciting year doing all that kind of work again, yes? Oh, very much so. And, uh, you know, I'm just finding it's um, – the need has never been greater. I yeah, mean, people yeah. really need to develop – clarity and relationships and do all the kinds of things we're actually going to talk about this morning in yeah. terms of culture and, yeah, and we'll what see. that looks like and how that continues to, um, you know, grow and evolve. And as we will point out, it doesn't happen quickly. It takes patience. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, yeah. And what about you, Jason? You are all over the place all the time. I would not be surprised if you haven't been coast to coast several times already. What have you been up to? I, I have actually been coast to coast, <laughs> uh, Mike, two or three times. In another day. It's been flat out. Um, and, and, but it's in such a good way. I mean, um, you know, in alignment with our topic today, you know, coming out of the new year, I mean, forget about the pandemic, forget about business crisis, forget about that. Even coming out of coming into the new year, uh, organically cultures are changing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it, rejuvenation, pe people taking some time off, reflecting on things, coming back yeah. into the workforce, yeah. new ideas. And yeah. yeah, I have been all over the country. Now the month of February, first couple of weeks, I'll be busy, but unlike Leo, I'm going to spend most of February in 80 plus degrees weather down. Nice. In St. Thomas. <laughs> oh yeah, baby. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. yeah. And, uh, I haven't uh, done any physical travel yet, you know, the odd little day trip here and there, but uh, I've been traveling the world virtually. I must have had already this year many uh, Zoom conversations, you know, as far as Australia on the one hand, Europe and the Middle East, uh, many, great. of course, all around the USA. And I just came out of a three-day virtual training of about 15 uh, professionals who are becoming forum leaders with uh, REF. Uh, uh, to run their peer forums. Of course, uh, you both are very familiar with REF and what we're doing there. And wow, what a blast it was again to be back doing that kind of work and helping them uh, get 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 focused and get straight and get excited about, about what a beautiful endeavor that is uh, to go onwards and upwards with. So anyway, let's talk about this culture thing. Uh, why it takes a turtle, not a rabbit. It's more of a marathon than a sprint. Don't expect quick fixes. It's going to be a long haul. You're going to have to accumulate and compound. Jason, do you want to get us started? I mean, when you think about this culture journey, 
and all that it takes. How do you think about it? Um, I, I, I think about it as a, a transformational, uh, transformational change, uh, yep. an evolution, right? Yep. It's not a, it's not a one-time culture plan and you put it on a shelf and then you pull it back out three years, look at it later and say, how'd we do, right? It, it has to be adaptive, right? It has to be agile. It, it has to be fluid. Yeah. Right. And and one of the interesting things in January, a, a big, big uptick right out of the gate in January um, in our culture work, Mike and Leo, has been has been with high level leadership, C-level leadership and, and VP level leadership focusing on unconscious biases, the blind spots leaders mm. have. Yeah. That's getting in the way of 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 culture evolution, of culture change. Right. And it's 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 not intentional. It's not purposeful, um, and but it slows down the process. That's what I'm saying. So, I, month of January, we've really focused on working with leaders and breaking down those blind spots yeah. that are having a negative impact on culture. Yeah, I love that that concept of blind spot. And of course, Leo speaks about that so much in the in the power of peers. In, in one way, mm -hmm. that that's really what peer groups all about, right? Making sure there are no blind spots in the room. But going back to what you said, sort of culture evolution, and and I would even say, and perhaps revolution, yeah. where we're stuck with an old paradigm blind spot that really has to be revolutionized into a new paradigm way to look at and think about culture and leadership and communication as we go down the path. Leo, what, what would you add into the mix here? What do you, what do you start thinking about when you think about this sort of marathon journey that culture really is? Yeah, I think that um, it, it takes longer than, than what people would like. I don't think there's any question about that. Um, I think there's two aspects of it for me. One, it's that, you know, kind of Mahatma Gandhi quote, right? Be the, the change you want to see in the world. Yeah, yeah. And there's that aspect of things that you've got to model what it is you're, you're trying to, um, you know, help instill in others. And there's also, um, and, and there was a book I read a long time ago um, uh, that was called um, Customer Comes Second. And it was written by Hal Rosenbluth and Diane McFarren Peters. And it's this concept, of course, that we're all familiar with now, Southwest Airlines and others, where if you treat your employees and they become your number one priority, then your customers, shareholders, and all these other stakeholders will be the big winners for it. Yeah. Um, so you, then you ask yourself, well, okay, I get that. So what could the book even be about? Like, right? Because what? I got it, right? We, we kind of understand that concept. Yes. <laughs> the, itch, the interesting part about it, though, is when you read the book, the the extent to which they are truly committed to that singular idea and the way there's all of these overlapping, overlapping policies and practices and things they do, the reach of it and the extent of it and the level of detail yeah. that goes into it is phenomenal. Because yeah. when we have, when we talk team and yet all our compensation and all our reward and awards programs and stuff are, 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 are focused on the individual, we've got a disconnect there with people. So, yeah. you know, I think when we want to create something and we can get clarity around it, then there's a question of really unpacking what it takes to live yeah. that experience. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm glad ahead, you Jason. brought yeah. that up, Leo, because last, last year I started working with a fairly large public utility company. And, and the fourth quarter of last year, we worked as an organization with the, I don't know, leadership team about 45 <laughs> and, and we developed together, they developed together the 10 commandments of a public utility company, hmm, right? Neat. And these 10 commandments was all wrapped around, you know, the employees within that utility company, including the union. Now, on February 1st, I'm going back in and we're taking those 10 commandments and using that as our baseline to create a singleness of purpose, right? From a leadership perspective, right? What is our most important single purpose? to the organization in order to drive those 10 commandments. That's culture evolution in my mind. Right, That's right. moving the needle on behavior change when it comes to evolving your culture. Yeah. And and it's even identifying those behaviors, right? Yeah. Because yeah. people can talk about values. There's, you know, those great articles that they talk about, you know, um, these values of integrity and they're etched in granite and all of that only to reveal that the, the <laughs> values you just read about were Enron's, right? Yeah. So, you know, they weren't exactly squaring with, with what was etched in, in, in stone. Um, so, 
when when you get down to because the values sound great like yep. trust and you know integrity and all of these kinds of things but at the end of the day you have to say how how do we live those things what are the behaviors and then how do we yeah. continue to kind of you know, expand our understanding of it and be imaginative about how we can do those kinds of things. And yeah, I love um, that. I that's love that. when you can start making things happen, I think. Yeah, you know, picking up on the on the behaviors thing. And I also want to come back to Leo's metaphor of, you know, the title of the book and then the book itself, because I think that is a really powerful metaphor when we think about the work of culture. But starting with behaviors, I couldn't agree more with what you just said, Leo. You know, the work I do most of all around this, Jason, is, you know, there's there's the core values on the poster on the wall. It's got all this great stuff, trust and integrity. And maybe maybe each one of those has a little paragraph that describes what we mean by that. And um, and and then, you know, people say, oh, we have a great culture around here. And so what I'll typically do is I say, well, OK, I understand. Um, I understand you do the beach barbecue. I understand you have a football table. And I understand that you do the town hall meeting every month. Fantastic. And you obviously intentionally try to live up to these core values as best you can in those moments. I said, but could I come and sit in on a meeting just for an hour, any meeting? I mean, not your most tactical meeting, not your most strategic meeting. Just let me come and sit in as a fly on the wall of a meeting. And I'll sit in on the meeting. And the first thing I'll notice is the core values poster isn't anywhere to be seen. So it's like, how on earth are we expecting these core values to be lived out here if they're not even on the wall in this room? And then I'll listen to the meeting. And at the end of the meeting, I will I will recount to them. Well, um, can you show me on your core values where it says it's OK for people to show up late? Because half of you did. Can you show me on the core values where it says it's OK for you to do electronics beneath the table? Because half of you did. Can you show me on the core values where um, it's OK for you to use excuses because when asked about, hey, did you get that done? Half of you gave excuses about being too busy. I didn't have time. Oh, I didn't know that was me. So can you show me on your core values where all of that stuff yeah. is? Because that's what you're living. And of course, you can't because back to your point, Leo, you haven't drilled into your core values with sufficient granularity to define the observable and audible behaviors that we want to see and hear around here. And on the flip side, the observable and audible behaviors that we don't want to see and hear around here. We have to get to that kind of clarity, don't we, Jason? Otherwise, this is just kind of hanging out on the wall as vanilla stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's 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 do what I say, not what I do. Yeah. Right, yeah. And, and, and that's that's a great, you know, one of the questions you posed for today's call is, you know, where do we start? And I think yeah. that's a great starting spot. Taking a look at taking a look at a mirror and are we aligned? Is our behaviors, is our actions aligned yeah. with we what what we expect our, our culture and our workforce yeah. experience to be? And, yeah. and and I think that's 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 the starting gate, right? Yeah. And I think back to back to Leo's metaphor of the book, I think I think it's fair to say, is it not, that many leaders, maybe present company excluded, of who's yeah. ever listened to this podcast, but many leaders are guilty, aren't they not, um, Leo, that when they think about culture, they sort of look at the title of the book, you know, culture, and they think, I got it, I got it, I don't need to read the rest of the book, I got it. I mean, what can the rest of the book be about, right? I got it. And yet, it is such a big book, everybody, that you have to get into to fully understand the breadth and depth and and timeline with which it takes to to build and compound and accumulate a yep. culture and by the way of course all three of us on this call have written books so we know so we know how much great stuff is in the rest of the book around culture i mean it's a long haul isn't it leo what would you say yeah, there's there's no question about it, and and you know part of the issue, and I I, I know you all see this all the time when you, you you speak at events or you do things like that, and everybody because we've heard all of this stuff a thousand times. We have. I mean, yep. everybody's been to presentations on culture and leadership yep. and all this stuff. So they sit in the audience and they have their arms crossed like this, and they're like, all right, you know, they <laughs> they never enter these things with a beginner's mindset. They know that their company culture is far from perfect. They can read all the stuff in the whole world, but they can't get from where they are to where they would like it to be. And so they would be wise to not 
come in with what they like to call like a full cup, right? You come into these conversations with an empty cup so that it can be filled with some ideas and and thoughts so that you can make, you know, culture is very much about who you are, not what you do. And there's a lot of reflection and there's a lot of work that it takes to get there. And on everybody's part, I think, yeah. And and everybody's got to own it. I think that's a great, that's that's a great inspiration. And and Jason, uh, what that inspires in me, Jason, is to invite everybody listening to this. Why wouldn't you want to get your key players in a room, your HR people, your training and development people, your, your operations people, perhaps, why wouldn't you want to get them in a room and sort of level set everybody and say, look, this year needs to be a breakthrough year of taking our culture to a whole nother level. How do we get started? You know, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. Let's start simple uh, uh, and small, and then let's finish big. How how does how do the how do people set out on that journey, Jason? What would you say? How do you get that snowball rolling to to add up to a breakthrough this year? How do you do that? Jason. Well, I think what you started is get get the key people, get the key stakeholders, get the key leaders, and get representation across the organization in yep. in, in in a group that way. Now, Mike, <laughs> I'm smiling because I just had that exact conversation last week. Perfect. And, and I threw down that challenge. Why? Yep. Why is it so difficult to grab these 12 people and put them in? A, let's get them in a room for two hours. You know, I know the answer. I got the pain is not large enough. No boy. Oh, I, that, here the, we go. <laughs> the pain point is not large enough to oh. go through the effort to make this change. Oh, so I boy. said, I, I said, you know, when the pandemic hit, um, and your world was turned upside down, how large was that pain? Right. And we got talking about that. And I says, what's the next business crisis? It's coming. Yeah. It could be a recession. It could be something. So why don't you want to get in front of the pain? Well, and where that, where my head went, where my head went immediately with that, and I'm sure Leo will jump in here too, is you, it's what's the hidden cost yeah. of, of, of poor, of, of your culture not being where you need it to be? What's the hidden pain, frankly? Yep. What's the hidden frustration, frankly? that exists in the, in the heads and the hearts of yeah. your talent and your people and your teams where they've, they've sort of almost given up, which is why you can't see it and hear it. Uh, it but the, 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 I think it's only fair to say, everybody, the risk is that the hidden pain, the hidden frustration, the hidden cost is 10 times the unhidden pain and the unhidden cost. And if, and if they don't do anything, Mike, that's going to rise to the top. Yeah. At some point, it, it, it it's going to surface and, and bubble over. Boy, oh boy, boy. That's beautiful. Leo, what would you, know, you, you know, Jason. I don't know, Jason. It makes perfect sense to me that someone would rather address, um, wait until they have stage four cancer in order oh, to address boy. it versus stage oh, zero, boy. right? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the absurdity of that is crazy. What I actually thought you were going to say is the reason they don't want to put in the people, those 12 people in the room or eight, however many there are, is they're afraid of what they're going to hear. And I think that's a bit, it's a conversation. It's a can of worms, if you will, that they don't really uh, want to open up. And I, and I think the other aspects of this too is, is by nature, I think a lot of um, CEOs out there that would, and I equate this kind of the SATs, right? They would rather solve the math problem than solve the reading comprehension problem because the math problem is much, right? It's much more finite. It's clear. The numbers add up or they don't. That is so right. That's an easy thing to do. All of a sudden, now you have to read something. You actually have to think and you have to problem solve and you have to do something where where the, the answer is far less clear. Yep. Um, then oh, I don't want to do that. I can, I can go solve this math problem right over here. You know, I know, I know that I got the answer right. Because yeah. I can, because I can just lay off four hundred people if I have to. You know, whatever. Yeah. I, you know, because to make the numbers add up. I mean, it's you know, it's it's, uh, it, it's hard work. The idea that we refer to this as soft skills and all this stuff is absurd. Yeah. It's the hardest stuff out there. 
the, yeah. the, the, the challenges around people and teams and relationships. And Jason, you brought it up, the attentiveness that you have to have to that on a daily basis. Yeah. You'll never get to a situation with your culture. The moment you start saying, hey, let's check out, we got that done. Let's check off that box and move on. That'll be the day you have to start worrying about it, right? Yeah, correct. So it, it's just, yeah. it's hard work. And it's know, that, and it, yeah, and it's that idea that, um, you know, when you need a friend, it's too late to make one. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you need the culture you'll need for the next crisis, it's already too late if you don't have it already. Now, of course, what many people might say is, well, hang on a minute. By and large, we just got through the last crisis uh, in some way, shape or form. I mean, obviously, lots of businesses went out of business, but many you know, managed to get through it. We just got through the last crisis. We survived. So surely our culture was up to the task. Well, yes, everybody, but what came next? Mm -hmm. The great resignation, which is really telling you that, yes, in a crisis, everybody hangs on to get through the crisis. Of course they do. But as soon as they get their chance back to go find a better culture, they're gone. Yep. So that's where you pay the price. That's where the hidden cost is. Yeah. That's where the hidden pain is. That's where the hidden frustration is. And that's when it starts walking out the door as soon as it possibly can. What do you think, Jason? No, I, I, I agree with you 100%. I said, you know, when I started this call today, I talked about, you know, even, you know, even coming back, forget the crisis, even coming back after a break with new, new years, new budgets, new strategies, yeah. Yeah. Um, new direction, right? New leadership. Your culture is different than, than it was December 31st already. Yeah. Yeah, right. exactly. You got to get your arms around it, embrace it and make sure it's going the right yeah. direction. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, we've all, we've all done not as much as you, Jason, but in some way, shape or form, we've all done these kinds of culture journey, transformational kinds of things. Um, love to hear more from you in a moment, Jason and everybody that's listening. The wrong place to start is some big abstract grandiose, Let's have a culture committee, you know, and let's uh, come up with a new set of six core values rather than the existing set that we've got. And let's um, do, you know, focus group after focus group after focus group to do all of that. And, you know, and 12 months later, you know, we've set out to boil the ocean and we've found out that we weren't successful. It's like yeah. it's like not don't don't not tackle some of the big picture stuff, but get going with small picture things right now, practical things that you can start to make a difference on right here, right now, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, and then get the snowball rolling from there. Start small and finish big. What 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 else would you encourage people to think about doing, Jason? Well, I'm going to go back to Leo's book reference, right? You know, your, your employees come first, right? Your, your customers yeah. come second. How many organizations out there have, you know, constantly efforts and the money they spend on getting what we call the voice of the customer. Yeah. Right. Mapping that customer experience, but how many of them for some reason don't see the value in, in voice of your employee, a VOE. Right. Okay, and, yeah. and, and I think this cultural journey really, really has a big component of a, of a starting line of, of, of getting the voice of your employee. Yeah. Right. And, and there's all kinds of tools and assessments and, and all kinds of ways of doing all that. But I, but I think your employee base has to have a voice in yeah. order to get this journey started and, yeah. and going back to the, you know, your customers come second, your employees first, let's hear those voices, give them the opportunity to be heard. Yeah. And invite, invite from them in, in the sort of free form parts of that invite from them you know, what little things, if we change them, would, yeah. would you know, start to move the needle. And then if we can be seen, maybe they give us 100 different things. We can't tackle 100, but we can come up with a short list of five at the yeah. top of that list that we can tackle. And, yeah, they're small things. They're simple things. They're not going to radically change the culture overnight, yeah. but they will start to radically change the perception that the leaders are taking culture seriously and are willing to start, you know, compounding that snowball effect with with small things first and big things later. Exactly. Leo, what other, yeah. what other thoughts do you have you want to share? 
I, I do want to pick up on what Jason talked about, though, in terms of inclusivity. Um, yeah. Culture isn't what the leaders say it is. It involves everybody. And it's, it's a really important part of it. And I know when so many leaders were trying to figure out what life at their company, what their culture is going to look like post-COVID, um, you know, I, I often, I, I would kind of often refer to um, Jefferson's quote where he says, you know, in matters of principle, stand like a rock. In matters of style, swim with the current. And I think this is a great opportunity for leaders to say, here are our standards. Here are our values. This is what we care about. Now, when it comes to our productivity and what we're trying to do here and meeting those standards of excellence and performing against those values, what does that look like going forward? And get people to come together and talk about, here's how we can live those values and meet those standards. And maybe it's not going in the office five days a week, or maybe it's working differently um, and, and creating that culture around those things that offers that level of inclusivity and ownership. And you know what, you can try something, if it doesn't work, you pivot and, yep. and you try something yeah, else and you exactly. learn and grow and you do it together. Um, and, and you all have that shared responsibility for your performance and, and all of it, whether it's performance, accountability, happiness, joy, whatever it happens to be, right? Yeah. So I, I, I think that that issue that Jason brought up about being inclusive about it and not hopefully gone are the days where we all go to the green briar for a week and come back with the tablets, you know, that the strategic committee has come up with and they impose <laughs> all of their wisdom on everybody, you know, and it, and it blows up all the time. Um, we need to involve people. There's great yeah. ideas um, and, yeah. and they're right and they're sitting right around us or they may be at home or wherever they may be. But our team and our staff is rich with ideas and enthusiasm and yeah. a willingness to help. Yeah. So, well said. Very well said. Jason, what are, what are some final thoughts with, from you that uh, other things you want to share? Well, you know, I, I, I think my final thought on, on today's podcast for our listeners is, is don't take this lightly. Um, right. Culture is not a light topic. It's 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 not a soft skill. Um, it really is a, a discipline, and and a discipline is something that's not put on a shelf. And and I would say, remember two things: that it's a discipline and it's a practice. Leo just said, yeah. adapt, yeah. pivot. Right? You can do that in culture journeys and not not make major mistakes. So yeah. my final two thoughts is. You know, deliberate and yeah. uh, keep the keep keep the employees involved. Yeah, and it isn't it isn't by accident, everybody, no. that we we call this podcast the one advantage. Yeah. That that is the hardest work of all to do, and yet it is the most rewarding and competitively differentiating work that you can do because your culture is the hardest thing to copy. It's the yeah. hardest thing to create. It's the hardest thing to copy. That's why we talk about the one advantage, the one and only advantage that you have that is least copyable by everybody else is what we call a peer-powered culture of agility. Culture is the pivotal word right in the middle there. That's what you're really working on. It's really what the work is of being yeah. a leader. Um, and so... Uh, uh, there we have it, everybody. Another uh, One Advantage uh, podcast uh, in the can. What a great topic, uh, guys. Any any final things you want to say before we leave here? We'll see you oh. next time. And next time, Leo, we're going to do we're going to do the Edelman. What's it called again? Edelman Trust Barometer. Yes, yes. The study that's been conducted since two thousand one across twenty eight countries around the world. And what it has to tell us about trust um, nice. in this world and in our workplaces. So, and that that could that. that could well be the bottom line of culture, everybody that we've been talking about today. Where are you on trust? So we will find out more about that next time. Uh, uh, there we have it, another one in the can. Uh, we'll see you next time at uh, the One Advantage Podcast, and uh, have yourselves a good uh, good few weeks. We'll talk Excellent. again soon. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the One Advantage podcast. If you liked this episode, please consider helping us by rating us wherever you listen, spreading the word, having us as a guest on your podcast or webinar, and mentioning us in social media. Find us at the One Advantage podcast where you can get more information about us and this episode. Thanks again for listening, and we look forward to more great episodes to come.